Hi everyone, welcome to our final artist talk in our Southbound series based on the exhibition Southbound, photographs of and about the New South um, on loan to LSU Museum of Art from the Halsey Institute. Tonight, I'm really honored to welcome our two guests, McNair Evans and Susan Worsham on behalf of um, the museum. Um, and I also just wanna start by thinking before we get into introductions and the conversation, um, by thinking the people who make this talk possible. Um, this program and this exhibition were made possible by a grant from the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge with support from the Office of Mayor President, Sharon Weston Broom and the Metro Council. Um, we're also really grateful to LA CAT for um, supporting LSU Museum of Arts programming. Um, we just couldn't do these without support. All of our exhibitions and programs are 100% donor supported. So thank you for that and our Communications coordinator Sarah is going to be um, throwing up some information in the chat, including a link if you would like to donate to support programs like this. She's also going to share the link for closed captioning if you would like to use that service that will be available. Um, and we'll also ask that if you want to ask questions, we will have a Q&A at the end. We'll do a facilitated conversation for about 35 or 40 minutes um, and then invite your questions. And if you put them in the chat, we'll catch them. Um, we'll also give you the opportunity to raise your hand using the raise your hand function um, and we'll call on you and you can ask your question directly. So um, please be thinking about what you might like to ask Susan and McNair. So um, I'm going to go back to showing you both of their work. Susan's work is on top um, and McNair's is on bottom. Susan Worsham was born in Richmond, Virginia, where she currently lives and works. She studied graphic design at Virginia Commonwealth University and also studied photography. Um, her work you may have seen at the Ogden Museum of Art nearby. Um, it's held in the collection of the Ogden Museum of Art, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the Chrysler Museum, and the Do Good um, Southern Photography Initiative. Um, in 2015, Susan Worsham received a Lens Culture Emerging Talent Award, and she was nominated in 2016 for the Baum Award for Emerging American Photographer, one of the largest national awards among the grants and fellowships available in photography. We also have with us McNair Evans, who grew up in a small town in North Carolina. Um, he studied cultural anthropology and found photography through oral history work with an Appalachian family, and then went on to earn an MFA at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. He studied with Mike Smith and Alex Soff, and he was a 2016 recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. His work is included in several major public collections, including the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. So we're really honored to have you both here. Um, I've been really excited about this talk. We've had a great series and I'm happy to close with both of you tonight. Your work is among um, my favorite featured in the exhibit and also was selected um, by MFA students um, who are in photography. So we're really excited that this, hopefully this talk really will, will connect with students at LSU. So um, to kick things out, off, I really want us to dig into two of your particular portfolios. And so I think it would be good to start to just hear directly from you. First, from you, McNair, if you wouldn't mind telling us about um, the body of work, Confessions for a Son. Yeah, uh, thank you, Courtney. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, many thanks to all the LSU students. I'm super grateful to be here. It's an honor. To talk, it's an honor to be included, and especially to have a conversation with Susan, whose work I think is absolutely incredible. Um, and thanks to all of you who've taken time out of your day to join us. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, Confessions for a Son uh, is a story that really began in 2000 uh, when I was a senior in college. I was studying cultural anthropology and just learning how much I loved photography through the process of photographing a family in the mountains of North Carolina. In the fall of that year, my father died unexpectedly. Um, and, and when he died, I, I learned about um, the state of his family businesses. Uh, they had been insolvent and, and I had not been aware of that. So the um, economic impact of that was pretty obvious and immediate, but the sort of emotional implication of that, um, the, the realization that there was so much about this father, this person that I loved dearly and admired that I had not known, uh, it, it really lingered and it, it lingered for a number of years. Uh, at that time, 
the situation was was bigger and older and much you know out of my hands it didn't really feel like there was anything i could do about it and and i had moved to another part of the country wyoming and idaho um working as a fly fishing guide and a photographer and then on to san francisco where i was in graduate school studying photography um when in 2008 I went home and, and had been a number of years and, and witnessed my hometown in the midst of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, the downtown was empty. The perimeter of the town was, was in rough shape economically. And, and I really felt like this, this place that I was from, uh, this place where my family had been so long and, and had been involved in small businesses there, uh, was disappearing. You know, I came back to San Francisco with the desire to make these pictures uh, of empty office and retail spaces in San Francisco to somehow comment or criticize about the economic system that was destroying my hometown. And, and after photographing in different spaces, uh, I realized that all my pictures were pretty empathetic. <laughs> like they included details of the people who worked there and really soft humanistic light. And it wasn't until I kind of really asked my that I realized that there was a, an emotional experience, a, a, a group of feelings that were coming out through my pictures that really related to my experience with my dad's death. Um, uh, you know, in 1978, MoMA did an exhibit of photography titled Mirrors and Windows, saying that, you know, some photographers use a camera as a mirror uh, of themselves as self-expressions and others as a window into the world. And, and I think I realized that I was really using photography as a mirror, a, a means of self-expression. So I had to the decision I could continue to photograph in San Francisco, uh, or I could go home and, and trace my father's life and, and make pictures exploring this uh, emotional experience that was coming out in my photographs. Um, so I moved to North Carolina and, and spent 15 to 16 months uh, tracing my dad's life as a biographer and, and, and getting to know him personally and photographing my experiences along the way. Um, that resulted in a 2014 book titled uh, Confessions for a Son and published by Alan Tiger Books here in San Francisco that combined uh, photographs that my dad had made uh, when he was in his 40s, the pictures I made in North Carolina, uh, snippets of oral histories from my family, and some archival letters. That's great. Sarah, maybe you could find a link to that and throw it up in the chat. I know it's something you can find on YouTube too and see a click through everything because we won't show everything today. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that overview. And, and Susan, you have a similar in a way story your your work is highly personal and motivated by family and kind of retracing your own childhood um can you tell us more about your um series bittersweet on bostwick lane yeah and i also want to thank you courtney and mcnair and i've been a fan of mcnair's work for a long time and you know you were saying uh when your work started uh, this work started i think around 2007 so you know, we kind of have like, yeah, a little bit of a time span where we're kind of both making this work at the same time. Um, so I never intended to make this body of work. Um, it's not an idea that I had. Uh, all my family had passed and I was showing my boyfriend my childhood home. And so on the right of my screen, which is maybe on the left of yours, uh, the hearse, it's, the photograph is called Hearse in My Childhood Driveway. Um, and that's my childhood home. I grew up on University of Richmond property because my dad was a chemistry professor. And to live on Bostwick Lane, you had to be a professor at the university. So all my family's passed. I'm showing my boyfriend my childhood home. And I go knock on the door. And the gentleman that lived there at the time was a biology professor. And, you know, I said, I used to live here. Can I look around? He said, sure, sure. He's like, don't mind me. I'm just cleaning out my snake's cages. <sighs> so I went up to my bedroom and there was a snake on the bed. And a little backstory here. My biggest fear is snakes. When I was younger, it was my biggest fear. And my mother used to always say, there's no snakes in your room. There's never gonna be any snakes in your room. And so when I saw a snake in my childhood bedroom, 
on the bed. I just kind of, I froze, I had an aha moment. And I just kind of realized that I hadn't really dealt with death, the death of my brother, my father, or my mother. And I asked um, the gentleman, the biology professor, ah, I took a deep breath and I said, can I come back tomorrow and, and make a picture of the snake on the bed? And he was like, sure, sure. And you know, I'm not sure why I did it, but I just, I brought my mom's wedding picture with me and, uh, and, and made that picture. And I didn't touch the snake. Uh, he placed the snake on the bed and it kind of made, it almost looks like a picture frame. It's almost in a rectangle. And so that's the first photograph that I took for this unintended series. Um, the next photograph, and, and again, I had that big aha moment that, you know, I know photography is what I'm supposed to be doing. I know it's my gift, it's what gives me passion. Um, but in this one moment, I realized where I needed to turn my lens, which was kind of inward. Um, and so the next thing that I did, uh, so my house no longer looked the same inside, um, but my oldest neighbor, Margaret Daniel, which is the photograph in the center, she lived at the top of Bostock Lane. She's the oldest neighbor from my childhood street. Her house looked exactly the same as it did when I was a child. Her basement where we took this portrait looked exactly the same. And, and in fact, in order to take this portrait of Margaret, uh, it, it might be hard to see, but there's a very light, light watercolor behind her. So what was hanging up on that clothesline which I took down to put the photo, to the you know the painting up, was a sheet, and so I was taking down the sheet, and the initials were J E W, and I was like, Margaret, is this my dad's sheet? And she was like, Why, yes. Now, I mean, my dad died when I was a younger girl, so the fact that she still had this white sheet and that it was that white um, was kind of amazing. But the picture that I hung behind her is a faded watercolor that one of our other neighbors did of her daughter, who was one of my first babysitters. Um, and I'll cut it a little bit short, but the, the story that's very important here um, isn't even the snake on the bed. It's this photograph of Margaret, who's kind of become my biggest muse, the biggest thread that kind of, you know, weaves my work together. So as I'm taking this photograph of Margaret, um, she tells me the story of my brother's last day. And my brother had died and, uh, well, he had become paralyzed in a motorcycle accident. And on his first visit home, he took his own life because he didn't want to live paralyzed. And so I'm taking Margaret's portrait and she goes, I remember your brother's last day. I made him a homemade bread, his favorite. I buttered a slice and took it up to him. He called down, Margaret, can I have some more of that bread? She's like, Susan, he finished the whole loaf. And then me and your mother went for a walk down the lane. And when we came back, he had shot himself. I didn't know this story. I knew that he had shot himself, but I didn't know that she was the last person to see him, let alone gave him her homemade bread. So about, I'd say maybe two minutes later, or maybe just a few breaths later, she said, and I remember when I made you my homemade strawberry jelly, you wanted to go upstairs and eat it on your clean white new bedspread. Me and my, your mother followed. You were a mess. You had jelly all over that bed. And those two things are my artist statement because those are two very different stains, right? You have the, the jelly, the sweetness of childhood memories, and then you have the stain that would have been on my brother's bed in his room that would have been a blood stain completely different. And so I kind of, I use, I use these two stains. I use the blood and I use the sweetness. Um, and all my work kind of is stained with that story. Thank you so much. So both of you have very highly personal work. It's, it's very beautiful. It has this quiet expressiveness. And I was really drawn like reading your interviews and listening to you um, both about kind of the parallels in the way that you both describe your own process and how you you went to take these photographs in with this approach of almost biography or you know looking at your family experiences and places but also it's about your experience then in those places taking the photograph um, and just trying to bridge past and present 
Um, can you talk about how you grew toward approaching photography in this highly personal way and how it's been a path for finding acceptance or healing in your family? Do you want me to start? Sure. Yeah. <sighs> Let me take a breath for that. So this kind of, I looked up intention the other day um, because somebody was asking what my intention and my work was. And I think it kind of goes for both me and McNair. Um, there's a, a second meaning of intention and it means the healing of a wound, which I didn't know. And, and I think it's pretty incredible because that is the intention in my work. It, it is the healing of, the, of a wound in a sense. Um, for me, Margaret, has taught me healing and you know and later I don't know how many of you know of my work or, or have been to my website um, but Margaret my oldest neighbor again she's been my biggest muse and she's taught me so many lessons and the work that I do isn't just the photographs that I make but it's sitting at her table with her and it's carving the rotten parts off fruit. Um, it's her making her homemade bread. So I told you she had made my brother her homemade bread. Um, she made homemade bread when I was there one day. And this is just, I'll give you this as an example of my healing and photography. Um, so she made her homemade bread and me and her sat in the kitchen with like, you know, big pieces, buttered, we were eating it and laughing. Um, and I asked her if I could take a piece home. So I took this kind of perfect big piece home and I didn't eat it. I let it rot and I kind of let it decay and it formed mold and it formed bacteria and just, you know, some ugly rotten parts. And I took a photograph of it and I brought Margaret that photograph later. And instead of her being upset that I had like let her bread mold, she was like, oh, oh we made saprolegnia. She started naming molds. There's rhizopus um, and getting so excited about the molds. And then she said, oh, look, the blue green mold, we made penicillin. And in that one image, I realized that penicillin is healing. So I'm taking this bread and I'm letting it rot. And, and homemade bread rotting, it's kind of like home rotting. It's like, you know, the ugly parts. And she's telling me that we made penicillin, which is healing. So through Margaret, and that, even that one little story, I have a thousand more. Um, through Margaret, I've learned that something that I thought was about loss has become about healing. And, and, and McNair, I don't know if you, um, I'm sure, actually, the more that we get into this work, it is kind of like a wound and you're digging around it, in it and you're seeing how many layers there are and what it feels like. But eventually, the more photographs that you make or that, or that I make, this kind of like weight of loss kind of lessens. It gets lighter and lighter the more work that I make and the more I kind of dig around in it. Mm. I think for me, uh, I've always come back to a quote by Thomas Merton, who was a Trappist monk in Kentucky in the middle of 20th century. And he said, you know, of what avail is it that we can travel to the moon if we can't cross the abyss that separates us from ourselves, right? So, uh, you know, that is the greatest journey of all. And without that journey, all other journeys are failures. And, and for me, uh, photography became a, a vehicle to, to know myself and a vehicle to know my father. It became a reason uh, and an excuse to, um, to research his life, to meet the people that knew him at different stages in his life. You know, I, in one hand, I had this person that I'd grown up loving and admiring and who was incredibly kind, caring, generous, and, and um, magnanimous to me. And on the other hand, I had this uh, sort of realization of these financial realities and I, I couldn't square the two. You know, I, I couldn't figure them out. I started kind of confused and angry and frustrated, you know, with the situation that had been left after his death. And, and um, using photography as, as kind of a vehicle of understanding, as, as a way to navigate the world, uh, I, I grew to know him as a person. You know, and, and photographs became a, a way to talk about his life. You know, um, 
I think it was Walker Evans that said, you know, the photographer is a, like a joyous sensualist because pictures traffic in feelings, not in thoughts, you know? So um, I was able to photograph these people and places and contents of his life. And, and instead of sort of trying to explain or understand, I was able to simply feel, you know, and, and try to make photographs that shared my experience, that shared my journey uh, of trying to get to know him. And, and that was challenging for um, other people who were involved in my immediate family and my extended family. And I'll, people just, we didn't want to talk about this, you know, it hurt. Um, but the pictures gave us um, a way to talk about it. We could say, I don't like that picture, you know, and, and that could be a stand-in for other things that might be more difficult to talk about. And, and slowly um, uh, the photographs became a, a way for us to develop a language around something that we hadn't discussed a lot. Um, yeah. Well, I know we're going to take um, just a couple of photographs and really dig into kind of what we're looking at, look at them really closely. Can you just talk about um, these two images? Yeah. So and how they relate to coming to know your father. Yeah. So the, the picture on the left was made in a company vehicle uh, at my father's office. So my dad worked uh, at an oil mill um, uh, where they would crush uh, cotton, seed, corn, uh, soybeans and extract the oil um, and uh, when he died uh, the building became empty it became a vacant property and and vandals uh, broke in and they stole everything they could you know uh, and they uh, broke whatever was left behind and this was a company car um, for that office and uh, you know when I found it they had stolen the engine out of the car they had broken all the windows, spray painted it, you know. Um, and, and I would go back to my dad's office periodically over a number of years and, and photograph there. It's, it's recently was burned down and, and now nature is kind of reclaiming the lot. And it's a place that I still go back and photograph over time. But, um, you know, I, I saw this car and I, every time I go there, it was like going to my dad's, tomb almost you know um it was it was hard and i photographed it a lot uh and i tried to photograph this car from the outside and from different angles and it always just felt like a picture of a car in a lot and and so i got in the car and was photographing it there and um it gave it a first person perspective you know all of a sudden you're you're in the moving vehicle that has wrecked um and there's this uh bible that sits on the dashboard that I belong to my dad's coworker, I believe. Um, it's a because it's Church of God General Assembly Bible. But uh, for me, this picture, um, you know, has always kind of represented the role of religion in my family. Because um, I felt like if you pulled the Bible off of that dashboard, whatever is left of that windshield would just fall in. You know, so we were kind of like battered and busted, but we were still just barely holding together. And, and it's almost, for me, uh, the picture is really about kind of the role of religion in our family through such a traumatic time. Um, the picture on the right was made in uh, the bedroom where I grew up in my mom's house. Um, and, you know, after my dad died, my mom was living alone. And um, the town, as I mentioned, was struggling financially like so many small towns in the United States are and burglaries became more common and in fact her best friend across the street woke up with a burglar on the back porch you know and so mom installed a floodlight uh, in the backyard to, to keep the backyard illuminated and, and hopefully dissuade anyone from trying to come in at night and this is an all-night exposure of that floodlight coming through my bedroom window. Um, so there's the blue light that you see uh, in the room is that kind of pre-dawn light starting to fill in. I opened the camera, went to sleep in the bed and woke up, you know, maybe an hour before sunrise and, and closed the shutter. But, um, you know, there's this kind of dichotomy between interior and exterior space, which for me, um, 
feels like a great visual metaphor for for feelings for isolations and and, and visually I, it very much is kind of a, a recording of of what my mom was feeling you know with the floodlight in her yard um, the picture on the left was made at a, a farm where my dad and his brothers worked um, and it was during a cotton harvest uh, in 2010 and for me it was really uh, a really kind of pastoral sort of mythical dream space almost you know that evoked a sense of travel and everything seemed perfect but just on the bottom right side of that frame there's a plume of smoke that's coming in and it's kind of that for me is sort of the punctum of the picture the idea that like not everything is as it seems here that there might be something just outside of you that is perhaps endangering or infecting this idea of of uh, romantic perfection. Um, and the picture on the right was a photograph of my dad's gun collection. You know, uh, his family had lived there for many generations, and in the rural South, you know, you kind of have a gun for every ancestor, right? So, like, uh, he was an avid bird hunter. I, I grew up quail hunting with him, and. And when he died, I oiled and wrapped his guns in newspaper, uh, which was just a traditional way to keep them from rusting. And we'd store them underneath the bed. Uh, and when I came back to do this project, you know, I pulled those things out of the bed, and my man, my eyeballs just popped out of my head. I, you know, I had gone through life and grown visually, and I, each one was like a little totem uh, of him. You know, the the newspaper text correlated with the New York Times from the month that he died and you know they had these shapes. And you even uh, shot this on a timeline like following the seasons. Yeah the yeah the, the project itself um, sorry I was just kind of talking about these individual pictures uh, the, the project itself was was shot in a way where I could use seasons as a way to reference his age yeah exactly. Sorry I didn't mean to interrupt I was just I recalled you saying that about marking time in that way, and it reminded me of that. Um, Susan, I know you've also, we're going to look closely at some of yours, and you mentioned the contrast bef between, you know, those first few photographs we looked at, they were a little bit more kind of literal, like the hearse in the driveway, um, and how you kind of grew to, just like McNair has these very ev evocative objects and spaces, how you grew to communicate a felt experience. Can you talk about that while we're um, looking at these images? Yeah, and I also want to say, McNair, that I I love how you were talking about the car is almost like a tomb. You know, it really, yeah. And also, yeah, because I love that image and I'd seen it before. Um, but after hearing you talk about your work, thank you for sharing that and just thinking that Thinking of that as a tomb, because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of language that we as photographers, especially dealing with personal work, um, there's like a language that we almost kind of uh, make up in a sense. So your guns, when they're all wrapped, they're almost like wrapped and ready to be buried in a sense or put away. Um, just like the image on the right here for me. Um, it's called persimmon grave and again they look like graves um one thing i haven't mentioned yet which you know we we may talk about later is that i take recordings of my oldest neighbor margaret because she's a, an amazing storyteller um so many stories that have to do you know with her and my dad. My dad bought white azaleas for our house and she bought red and pink azaleas for her house. Uh, my mother's camellia tree that still is growing in the backyard that Margaret showed me. Again, when we were talking about healing earlier, um, it's another kind of thing that Margaret makes me notice is that my mom's camellia tree is still growing and flowering in my childhood backyard. But one of the stories that Margaret told me that I have on audio, um, and, and the audio a lot of times circles around and makes me make work, like new work. Uh, she told me about taking my brother and the young child on the left represents my brother. So you have that fruit in the bed, almost like that sweet jelly. Um, and this is my friend's son. 
and again, it's hard for me to talk about family because how, how do I do a project about family when all my family is gone? Um, and so a lot of times I'll have placeholders. So Max, my, my friend Len's son represents my brother. And then I have a girl named Georgia that I photograph and I've photographed her since she was very young. And now she's maybe like 17 or 16. Um, and she grows as I make the work. Um, so Macro, Mac, Max represents my, my brother. And so Margaret is telling me this story. She's like, I used to always take the children to the persimmon tree at the university. Your brother always had a ring of persimmon stained around his mouth. And so I went to find that persimmon tree at the university and I found it. But I also found these like structures and these structures to me, you know, I think they were getting ready to build onto the, to the university and uh and they have these amazing like it's almost blue black rotten fruit that's pulled where the rain fell and then the new persimmons which are that kind of orangey red kind of fresher ripe color and immediately before i even got my camera out and put the dark cloth over my head i said persimmon grave uh, they were gravestones. It's like my, my brother was no longer alive to like be taken to the persimmon tree. And then also when I was talking about those two stains in the beginning, um, blood stains and then the sweet stain of childhood and youth, uh, there's a photograph that I don't show um, because Margaret doesn't like it, but I took her home from the dentist and she's laying back on a chair and she has this tatted American flag on the back of the chair and she's asleep and she kind of looks like this. She kind of looks dead, so she doesn't like the photograph, but she has this beautiful, to me, red blood stain around her mouth after coming back from the dentist. And to me, the more that I make work, like I was saying, the more connections I can make. That audio where she talks about, your brother always had a ring of persimmon stained around your mouth, that sweet stain. And then she is kind of like, it's like a blood stained mouth of a storyteller because she's the one that told me about my brother's last day. So I use that circle a lot. Like McNair, like you were using seasons, that circle to me, it's the same kind of thing. It's like the circle of life, you know, because when the fruit falls from the tree, and it's ripe and it hits the ground and it begins to rot. Then it kind of sinks into the ground and it nourishes the ground and then things can grow again. Um, there's the bread that I was talking about earlier. So, and it's called communion. And again, that was like, you know, in a sense it was my brother's uh, last supper. I actually want to bronze it later, you know, if, if, if I can do that. Um, so in Margaret's kitchen, I always enter through the kitchen door. She's always doing something that is completely inspiring me. And again, talking about this language, I'm very in tuned to the language of loss to healing, the certain language that I use. So like McNair talking about the car being like a tomb, right? And it's also a small enclosed space. Um, <clears throat> on the right, Margaret, this is called, uh, I'm glad you have it listed, sometimes I forget the exact, pollen knife, Margaret with collected pollen from my mother's camellia. So again, in the audio, and the audio plays, so when this work is shown, Bittersweet on Bostock Lane, the audio just kind of wafts down and follows you as you walk around the gallery. And so the connections that you make can be different every time. You don't have to stand in front of the image and like, you know, be hooked to one story. So, and there's a particular one where she's like, look, look over there. Isn't that it? Isn't that the one? Isn't that your mother's tree? And you hear me say, my mother's camellia. And she's like, oh, you got to get a picture of it. Um, and so I actually went and collected the pollen from the camellia and brought it back to Margaret. And she studied it with a knife. A lot of times we'll dissect flowers at her kitchen table. The title Bittersweet on Bostwick Lane comes from a day that I was at Margaret's 
and I looked out of her big picture window and there were this kind of like a nest of these kind of red little blood-like berries in between the trees. And I was like, Margaret, what is that? And she's like, oh, it's bittersweet. And I was like, ah, bittersweet on Bostock Lane. That, that's my title. Because it's like this invasive kind of almost like kudzu, right? It kind of co covers and chokes, but it's still beautiful at the same time. Um, gosh, I, yeah, there's so many connections with Margaret. So many. I'll, I'll say one other one. The biggest kind of thing that I've learned from her is the role of death in life. And I'm going to read one little quick thing. And this, again, is part of an audio. Um, we were in her yard picking up this old kind of branch that fell from her walnut tree, and it had this like fungus all over it. And she goes, look, look what it's doing. It's eating it up, taking it back to nature. It's a fungus. Look at it. See what it does? It's a wood rotter. It rots the wood and takes it back to nature. So again, when talking about healing that we were talking about earlier or learning, there's this fungus that's made specifically for that walnut branch to pulverize it and kind of take it back to nature so that things can grow again. So it's kind of like renewal and healing and, and all of that. It's kind of amazing. And I don't even remember your question, Courtney. Oh, it's great. You're, <laughs> we were talking about the kind of evocative um, way that you approach spaces and objects. Um, and so we've heard kind of some of the stories and the significance of these, these objects and places. Can you both um, maybe start with you, McNair, talk about your process, um, what kind of camera you're using, the length of the exposure, just, you know, the things like that that people are probably interested in, just looking at the beauty that you've achieved, you know, the craft in these photographs. Thanks, thanks Courtney. Yeah. Um, you know, this whole project was shot um, on four by five field camera. Um, and some images were made on a six by seven uh, Mamiya 7, which is a rangefinder. You know, a lot of people will just photograph with one camera, but I, I find when I'm working with a four by five camera, there's a lot of waiting involved. You know, it's a slower process to set, set up a camera and kind of wait for things to get just right. And so sometimes I'll move around with a smaller medium format camera and photograph even while I've got four by five cameras set up. It's totally indulgent. Um, this, this particular picture was, uh, yeah, it was made by a four by five camera. It was made on Christmas morning. Uh, I just woke up early that morning um, to um, see the light. This was my grandmother's house. Um, and I wanted to see the sun coming over the mountain. Um, and um, I found this card game, uh, it was a game of solitaire that was left on the table by my mom. And, and you know, uh, made this picture. I was really interested in the, the visual relationship between the mountains and the frost on the window. I wanted to make that a part of the image. You know, I, I, I don't photograph really extraordinary things. You know, I mean, this is just a table and a card, cards and a window, and this is just my bedroom. But what is interesting to me is to find the extraordinary in the ordinary. You know, like I think of that John Cage quote a lot. Something's boring after two minutes, look at it at four, then eight, then 16, and eventually you realize it's not boring at all, you know? And, and so that was kind of the nature of this project is, is looking at the things that, that created the world around me, the world around my dad, and giving them enough attention to find that special connection, to sort of connect with them empathetically and, and be able to breathe that, that personal connection into the photographs, you know. Um, so um, all of this project shot on color negative film. Um, it's um, then scanned and, and printed as archival pigment prints, but uh, I work with different cameras for different projects. And, and for me, it's just really important that there's a kind of a conceptual um, and aesthetic alignment between the tool and the project. You know, this is, this is a project that addressed the past. It's a, a project about kind of taking your time, moving slow, seeing, seeing uh, the space around and immediately, immediately are surrounding in new ways. Uh, so How film composed it. is it? What's that? How composed 
are these sh shots in terms like are you setting these journals here are you photographing absolutely things find yeah them? yeah you know a lot of people like to use the term take when talking about photographs like you took that picture here and you I took that picture there but you know i i, I kind of at war with that concept i think that we make our pictures we have the ability to have complete control over them you know they are fictions um not reality and like for example on this afternoon i'm just helping my mom clean out my dad's belongings that were in the attic and uh found this group of journals and there were it was called the journal of southern history and i was like whoa that that sounds a lot like what i'm working on a journal of southern history <laughs> like <laughs> and then there were a couple of them that were repeated which expressed uh he had two copies of certain issues you know and so I put them on on the table in my mom's backyard and photographed them there, you know, so um, uh, Pretty much all of my photographs are, are composed, you know, uh, there's a, a fine line for me that I'm trying to navigate between um, a sense of composition and a sense of uh, documentary style, you know, I think both Susan and I work in this sort of documentary style in the sense that our work appears that it could have happened naturally in the real world but uh in fact i would say that susan and i are both working in kind of these liminal spaces right we're creating these sort of hyper real magic realism photographs within the contents of the real world yeah susan, can you share about yours your yeah and i'm uh, totally going to agree with that um and i'll talk about this image in a second but for for any kind of students or just, you know, lovers of photography that are listening, um, one of my favorite images, remember I talked about the fact that Margaret showed me that my mom's camellia was still growing in my childhood backyard. Um, well, that camellia, it's not grand, it's kind of puny looking, um, but it is still growing, so it's still beautiful. But I found this camellia near our house and the camellia near our house that's not at my childhood home is huge i mean i took a i took margaret to it so in a sense you know the camellia story is true but i always tell students especially if i'm giving a talk and that image is showing i have an image of margaret standing in front of this grand camellia tree that is probably 14 feet tall. I've never seen such a large camellia. Um, and it looks like a spine. It has this curve to it. And it is so full of flowers. It looks like it could break. And Margaret's standing in front of it with her cane. And she's hunched over. Her back is hunched over. And then the camellia is behind her. And it's just beautiful. Um, and that particular camellia, again, in a sense, you know, I, it's a setup photo. Like, I feel like when you're taking photographs, I don't care if it's found, I don't care if you set it up, um, none of that matters to me. It's getting your vision out and getting your, to me, that story of my mom's camellia still being in my childhood backyard is so much bigger and more magical and beautiful than the actual puny little tree that is in the backyard. Um, and so I'm going to choose, if I'm going to have it be in a photograph, for it to be like I think it should be, which is just grand and beautiful. And then later, and I, I don't know how many years later, I would say at least five years later, maybe six, um, a tree in Margaret's yard fell. It fell down and she told me about it. And they had cut a lot of the limbs off. And I went and took a photograph of her in front of it. And it is like a sister image facing the opposite direction of that beautiful tree that represents my brother's spine, that camellia. And then the sister image is Margaret standing in the same kind of position with her cane. But the tree is, and it's a different tree, but the tree in her front yard is completely down with the limbs cut off. So the time that I spent on the series allowed me to make that connection. And now I have these two kind of, you know, bookend beautiful photographs of her with a broken and limb cut tree that, and both of those trees represent my brother in a way. Um, 
another thing. I get a lot of stuff. I'll be looking on eBay for something. I found this is called light through embalming fluid. And I usually take photographs in Margaret's basement because she has amazing light down there. And it's where I played as a child. And I can kind of be on my own for hours and hours. And I'll hear her sometimes on the phone and she'll be like, oh, she's just down in the basement looking for her light. And I love that. Um, so I found this embalming fluid by accident on eBay because I wasn't looking for it. <laughs> um, someone, you know, that was selling stuff that I liked also had embalming fluid and it was this hot pink color. And in my work, color is very important. And I don't use kind of decayed uh, dark red colors a lot. I use like bubblegum and candy pinks. It's again, it's that sweetness from my childhood. It's the fact that I never saw the scene of my brother's death. I didn't have to see the nastiness or the blood or any of that. So that seeps into my work, um, the death and the decay but I do it through kind of pretty colors. Um, so this was this beautiful hot pink embalming fluid, which is like preserving. Um, and when the light hit it and went through it, it turns like this yellow color right where the light hit it. And I don't even understand why. Um, and this is light through embalming fluid. But what's interesting is what's right beside it. It's the chores that I do with Margaret. We make crab apple jelly every year. And we sit there and we take all the rotten parts out of the crab apples because it makes it more palatable just in a sense like my work is more palatable because i'm not showing you grotesque suicide you know head wounds or any of that right i'm making this work about loss and death a little more palatable because the photographs are beautiful so we take those rotten parts out and we squeeze all the juice from the apples and that's what is in the photograph beside that embalming fluid is that like preserved fruit and that preserved you know color and flavor so this um true aid so this is a uh it's a richmond virginia kind of old beverage and the interesting thing about this is that I didn't even know if I was taking this for bittersweet on Bostwick Lane or for my next project by the grace of God. Um, it's just on my back porch. I was on my way home and I saw this woman in her yard and she was cutting down this beautiful, huge like hydrangea bush. And so half the hydrangeas were already cut in, in her yard. And I like, you know, pulled my car over and I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, can I have these? And she was like, yes, of course. And she gave me a trash bag and I put all the dead, you know, hydrangeas in a trash bag. And when I took them out of my trunk and out of the bag in the car, I found all these little snails that were alive. Um, so there's one you can see on the E that's behind the A and D on the True A that's on the bottle. And there's one kind of to the left of the bottle. There's a few more in there that are, that are you know, hard to see. But I love the fact that I found life in the death again. You know, it's kind of like that healing again. Um, and this is from By the Grace of God. Again, By the Grace of God is kind of, I kind of explain it like, um, it's just kind of like after I've left my childhood yard and I'm kind of going off into the world. Um, this represents, well, first of all, when taking this image, and this, this is kind of like my most, I guess, well-known well -known image. Um, and I was very, very lucky. It was just an Edward Hopper show. And it's kind of cool when photographers get to be mixed with painters because it doesn't happen too often in a show. Um, and a lot of people don't know this, but when I look at this Marine's eyes, when I look at this photograph, I see my brother because he was in the 82nd Airborne. And so I see like a young soldier on a bed um, and I, yeah, so I always see my brother and that's just, you know, I, I, I think I always find myself in whatever landscape I'm in. Um, I was an artist in residence at Lightwork in Syracuse, New York, a very, you know, very different from Richmond, Virginia. And I made some photographs there. And the last day where I have to kind of show some work that I've made, you know, everybody kind of gathered around the table and they're like, oh my gosh, you made Syracuse look like the South. And in that one moment, I realized that I kind of bring myself with me and find myself in the landscape wherever I go. So now I kind of know I can kind of take photographs anywhere, right? 
it's a great um, entree too. I just want to acknowledge two other projects of yours. Um, I think McNair, you did this after Confessions for a Son, um, and kind of took some of your lessons from working on that that first project um, into In Search of Great Men. Um, and can you just talk about how you approach these subjects and like finding acceptance? in yourself and, and from them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, let's see. I, I was in the process of finishing up my previous project and was um, trying to write an essay for it. And there, I was really struggling to do the writing in California where I live because it was so far removed from where I made the project. And so I took the train uh, from California back to North Carolina and I had this journal with me and I was going to write in it. I was going to do this essay. and and um, I think because I was so um, charged, if you will, um, I, I realized that kind of everybody on that trip was was on a journey of sorts. You know, a lot of people I talked to were in these states of transition. They were uh, traveling to reunite with um, people they loved that they hoped would love them back. They were traveling to start a new life somewhere. Um, you know, there were just so many amazing stories um, and, and everybody was kind of uh, operating in this this notion that life can and should and will be better, you know, a, a sort of trust or a hope, a search for hope that I, I feel like is quite um, um, indelible to our national identity, perhaps, um, or, or at least uh, to what unites us, can unite us. Um, and, and so I spent uh, a number of years traveling by Amtrak, uh, multi-day trips, two to three weeks at a time, um, just sleeping, eating, photographing on the train. Uh, I would carry a small composition notebook with me uh, where I would paste in photographs I was making from the previous trip and people would write their stories about why they were traveling. And uh, quite simply approaching people would just be introducing myself, uh, telling them who I am, sharing a little bit of the project I was working on and asking if they'd be willing to write a little bit about their lives. And uh, it was amazing that people would open up and share so much. Uh, in fact, I'd love to just like quickly read one, uh, one writing that someone uh, shared. It will only take a couple minutes. Um, That'd be great. Uh, this was um, someone I met traveling from Chicago back to New York. Uh, the train can be comfortable and convenient. I'm riding the train this Friday, February 10th for Connection. I rode the train three months ago to start a new life in Chicago, hoping that by making such a drastic move from my home in Philly, that my career would blossom, that I would be able to do more for my boys, and that everything would start to make sense. But with each day, I seem to grow fonder of the life I moved away from. The distance made it clear to me that there are people that mean the world to me, London, Liam, Ali. I'm hoping this train brings me connection, uh, especially with the love of my life. It's strange to me how living 30 minutes away from someone you love can make you distant, but living 13 hours away can make you fall in love all over again. Um, so just the vulnerability and, and the honesty uh, that people uh, would share their life stories with me, you know, it, it made me really, um, look for and appreciate um, that aspect that, that we all share this desire to, to kind of try to be the best we can be, to live the best life we can. And, and the project is really about that. You know, it's, it's around um, uh, kind of recognizing that greatness is not um, the place where we are born or um, the possessions that we have, but it's uh, the type of people we want to be, the types of lives we want to live, the types of contributions we want to make to society. One final question for Susan, same thing, to talk about um, your By the Grace of God series, and will you reference the title? Um, and after that, we're going to open it up to the Q&A, because um, we're coming up yeah. on 630. Um, it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, of where McNair went from such a personal body of work um, and kind of getting to know yourself. It just makes you more open 
when you go, Pat, I don't know, it just makes you more open. By the grace of God, it's a, it's a very open series for me um, where I'm given these gifts if I'm present, if I'm present in the work and I, I'm very lazy. Uh, so I'll tend to want to sleep a lot. And photography is the only thing that's ever just gotten me up in the morning to see a sunrise, um, just to find beauty in the world. Um, and I don't, I don't think I mentioned this, but my brother in his suicide letter wrote, I arrived home just about the time the honeysuckle blooms. And I thought that was so beautiful and just so heartbreaking because he was not the kind of person to notice flowers. He jumped out of airplane. It just, it just wasn't him. And the fact that he knew it was the last time he was going to hear the birds or, or see the honeysuckle, he noticed that beauty around him because it would be for the last time. And when I go out and take photographs in the world, I just really remember to notice that beauty. That's like, you know, the biggest gift. Like I've been given a gift uh, on just how I can just find beauty in the world and connect with people. So, the, and I'll just talk about these two photographs really quick. A lot of times when I'm out in the world, I'm photographing something else. Um, and I'm kind of given a gift. So in this first photograph, uh, it's, it's Destiny, Grandmother's Roses, Virginia. So I was photographing this swing set in this kind of overgrown backyard and you know the end of daylight hitting it. And I was kind of photographing it because again, I'm, I'm finding myself in the landscape. It's an abandoned house with an abandoned playground and overgrown grass where the family is no longer there. So that kind of represents me. So that's why I'm there taking a photograph. All of a sudden, this young girl and her little brother who's on the back on the swing set come around the corner. And I'm like, <gasps> because, you know, uh, for me, I love taking portraits. I'd much rather have somebody in, in the photograph. And so I get really excited, but I kind of also stay away from them because I shouldn't be talking to other people's kids. <laughs> and I was like, wait, come here, come here. Where's your mom? And they were like, you know, we live right there. I'm like, will you walk ahead of me, but take me to your mom? And so we went to the front door and, you know, they let me in and I knocked on the door and I was like, oh my gosh, I was taking a photograph next door. I would love to take a portrait of your children, may I? And she said, yes, but as I'm talking to her, I look over her head and on the wall in their house um, is what Destiny is holding here, this kind of wooden, beautiful sconce of carved roses. And it was on the wall. And I immediately said, oh, what is that? I was like, can we take that down? Because she said it was her grandmother's roses. And so I was like, can we take it down? So we're, you know, in a chair in the house, getting down her grandmother's roses from the wall to make this portrait. Um, and to me, you know, I, I didn't know this was going to happen, but to me, grandmother's roses, it can be her and her brother, you know, growing, you know, older, growing from children. Um, it can be a corsage in a sense where she's growing into a woman. It is the, takes the same shape as a funeral spray that would lay on a casket. So then it could be about, you know, um, grandmother's roses like you know passage of time and death there's so much you know that I read into that photograph and again it's kind of like it's by the grace of God it's like this gift that I was given if I go out you know and meet the work right if I go out into the world if I don't go out into the world I'm not going to have these things happen um, and the other one I was waitressing, and this is again for students. Um, I was waitressing when I took this photograph and I tried to no longer tell myself, oh, I would love to photograph that spot, but I'll do it some other time. I try to do it now. Um, and so I'm wiping down tables in the restaurant. I am the only waitress I am in, in this weeknight, it's slower. I'm the bartender, I'm the host, I'm everything. So I'm wiping down tables, we're getting ready to open, and I see this girl with blue hair walk by, and I was like, oh my gosh, I ran outside and followed her, and this is the back of our restaurant, it's like an alley, um, and I was like, oh my gosh, can I take your photograph? And she was like, well, I have to go to work. I'm like, I'm at work, <laughs> please. Um, and she's like, I don't think I have time. And then the cat jumps on the car. And I was like, but the cat's on the car. Can I at least look through my camera? And she was like, okay. And so I got out my view camera, which is, you know, 
what McNair was using. It's a large, cumbersome camera. I got out my view camera, quickly put a sheet of film in after I focused, got one picture. Luckily, it came out, and I had a table, and I had to go back inside. Um, but the beautiful thing about this, when I talk about finding beauty in the world, sometimes where others don't see it, to the left of this image is a gross, huge trash can with the worst, like, fish and meat. It's restaurant, so you can think, like, it's a week's worth of, like, rotten food. There's beer bottles everywhere. There's cigarette butts on the ground. Also kind of to the right of the car. So this is not a pretty spot, and anyone driving by would not be like, oh, that's beautiful, but it's like finding your beauty in the world. You know, I'm focusing on what I find beautiful and not looking here and not looking there. Great. Well, we have had a few um, questions for you both. The first one is for McNair. Um, and someone asked, what does the gun wrapped in paper underwater mean to you? I don't think we showed that one in this, um, this slideshow, but. Yeah, so, um, you know, I kept photographing those wrapped guns just because they were so potent. And, and kind of the way Susan says, you know, I'm interested in potency of form. Like, what else can this mean? Uh, not, not just what does it mean on its own, but how can I uh, take an object uh, through my process and give it new meanings? And, and so uh, that was a gun that belonged to my grandfather. Uh, and I took it to uh, a creek, which was um, where our family was from, and, and threw it in the river to photograph it. Uh, and to me, it was a symbolic gesture. It was... <clears throat> performative for the picture uh, as a way of kind of washing my heritage or sending my heritage down the river. You know, rivers have always been uh, sort of a, a trope for cleansing, for time passing, for baptisms, you know, and all those things were uh, part of my desire for my relationship with my own heritage. And, and, and that's why I photographed the gun there. Yeah. Thank you for that. Bruce Morgan asks, um, I think it's for both of you, would you comment on the tension you feel between public and private in your work, specifically how it strikes you and affects your work? I, I, I don't know if you want to tackle that, Susan. I personally, I don't know if that means like public and private in terms of being exhibited or I, I'm not sure I necessarily understand the question. So, is Bruce still here? I'm not sure if I understand it either. Public, I'm very open with all of my work. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I want to answer it. We'll see if he types anything in. If anyone wants to raise their hand too, you can un we can unmute you um, so you can ask your question directly. Um, yeah, I would love I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, um, it's interesting to me that both Susan and I are making photographs from a place of sorrow, you know? And so I've been reading this really incredible book by um, Douglas Abrams. It's called The Book of Joy. And it's a book of interviews with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. Um, and there's a passage that I read last night that I, I think I'd like to share. Uh, and he's reflecting over uh, the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu talking the week. And he says, you know, over the course of the week, both of these uh, spiritual leaders commented that there is no joy without sorrow. That in fact, it is the pain, the suffering that allows us to experience and appreciate the joy. Indeed, the more we turn toward suffering, our own and others, the more we can turn toward the joy. Uh, we accept them both, turning the volume of life up, or we turn our backs on life, becoming deaf to the music. And I, I think, you know, that's really what I see in Susan's photographs is, man, the volume is full blast. You know, the, the pictures are operating in this place where the emotion is turned up and it's a liminal space. It's a rite of passage. It's, it's in this malleable, slippery time space existence that she takes us. And there we learn about ourselves and we learn about her and we're able to kind of experience these deepest, darkest mo emotions. And through that, gain this, a, a sense of camaraderie, a sense of connection. Uh, and, and for me, ultimately, that creates a sense of joy as well. 
Me too. Just making them, right? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of, I think a, a lot of, it's weird, a lot of loss that I've had. And, you know, I put a lot of, oh my gosh, like, you know, if, if Margaret is holding like a knife with icing on it, but she cuts her finger, I'm like, yes. I'm like on, oh, there's, all right, wait, Bruce. Yes, Bruce. <laughs> awesome. Good. I'm glad that, yeah, because I didn't understand. I'm glad that he got a good answer. Yeah. Um, I don't even know where I was going with that, but. Are there any other questions? We have one for McNair. Maybe you can read if you're reading the chat, but I'll read it out loud in case someone's not. Um, can you talk about your relationship to images as objects in installation? For example, sometimes layering images and playing with framing and unframed pictures together and how you make choices about scale? Yeah, I mean, I, I like to think about each installation as, I, I kind of, you know, I like to think about it as totally its own. It's important to me that to play a space, you know, I think about, you can, you know, there are probably some bands that go on tour and they play the exact same set of songs, regardless of the venue. And then there are probably some bands that mix up their set list, depending on the space. And for me, I really enjoy, in fact, just thrill to uh, take the work I've made and interpret a space with it and think about how I can use size and scale and the layering of imagery to move someone to that space physically, uh, to bring them in close through small pictures, to push them back out with large pictures, to create a, 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 an emotional experience through how I navigate them through the space. And like one show comes to mind, I was hanging it um, at, at a photo event in Georgia called Slow Exposures. And I, I had this big piece that was like 40 by 50 and there really wasn't room to hang it. And so I just left it wrapped in plastic leaning against the wall and it was this big like pixelated picture of my dad's face. And, and that in itself was so potent. You know, you weren't sure if the show wasn't ready to see yet, you know? And, and so it created this kind of uncertainty with someone, they kind of, I also left like some tools around the base of it. So you kind of felt like you were walking, interrupting somebody's work. And I always like to think about the formal qualities of an exhibition space or a book, the materiality of how a book is constructed to create emotional experiences that align with the messages that I'm trying to communicate through my photography. Um, like one quick example of this is in the book for Confessions for a Son, uh, we increase, we included a loose letter that was a Christmas letter that my mom, my dad wrote to my mom and it was absolutely beautiful, a testament to his love and affection and dedication to her, you know, and, and she was generous enough to share this with me and let me reproduce it and include it. And we've reproduced the handwriting and the stationery. So it just really felt authentic. And, you know, you pick up the book. And lots of times this would fall out. So you felt like you just dropped something really special, like you've made a mistake, there's a bit of anxiety. Or you would kind of discover it in the book somewhere and feel like you found something personal that belonged to somebody else. Um, and, and we left it loose so that it could move. You could use it as your placeholder. So no matter where you were in the book sequence, you would come back to this. This was the foundation, you know, this love, this commitment, these aspirations. Um, so when it comes to book design, to exhibition, I, I always am thinking about the materiality of, of, of my work and, and how I can create an emotional experience um, in someone through those. Well, thank you so much. And I think, oh, we did have one more question come through right when I thought we might not. Um, The, the person says, um, Mr. McNair, you shoot the past in a physical manner. Um, the guns, the cards from the night before on Christmas morning. Susan, you shoot the past in a metaphorical sense. Would you both say that shooting these photos and these manners brings out the best representation of the emotions you're trying to convey in your work? And I think this will be our final question for the night. 
You know, uh, gosh, I, I shoot a whole lot of objects in still life also. We didn't maybe show as many. I exhaust every kind of thing that I can when making this work. Again, I take audio conversations of Margaret and when McNair was kind of talking about like, you know, an exhibition, when that work is exhibited, I'll have her, she used to be a biology professor, I'll have her microscope there and that's kind of the lens that she used to use to look at things while I use a camera lens. Um, I'll have the audio playing, I'll have these microscopic slides um, with things like, you know, human umbilical cord uh, section of, you know, a certain flower butterflies tongue. I use, you know, every, every kind of thing when making this work, just objects, sculpture. I actually made a Carrera marble grave and I had a grave carver carve the word fruit in it. Um, it kind of refers back to that image persimmon grave. So I think we both use a lot, and I'll let McNair, McNair finish, but yeah, uh, just, be, you know, you've only seen a little bit of work today. Um, gosh, I exhaust everything that you could imagine and keep on making connections and making work and doing it in different ways. Yeah, I, I echo that. If I see something that really interests me, I go back to it. And, and like Susan, I'm always collecting is so much raw material, uh, audio, video, making lots of photographs. But I think what it really, the, the core of that question for me is um, this notion of being a literalist. Like I, I, I definitely um, don't feel like I'm, I'm simply photographing artifacts and, and making documents of artifacts. In fact, we're in, regardless of what type of art it is, I, there are usually like three criteria that make me uh, believe that it's worth sharing with someone. And, one is, is it visually interesting? Like as an object, as a photograph, uh, is the line, the color, the form, like visually from a design perspective, is this something that I'm gonna wanna look at for a long time? Like, is it visually interesting? Then the question is, is it narratively relevant? So in, in the parameters of this project, uh, narratively, does it relate to my father's life? And then third, is it metaphorically potent, right? Uh, do those two things, uh, the visual properties of the image and the subject matter add up to something else that is symbolic or metaphoric that can then transcend uh, the object that was photographed. And, and those, that's kind of like a Venn diagram that I'm always using when I'm editing and thinking about what photographs I want to share or uh, really whatever type of art I'm looking at, I'm asking those three questions. Great, thank you so much. This has been such a great talk and I am so grateful to you McNair and you Susan for sharing such kind of personal stories about your family through your work and through this conversation. Um, this is our final Southbound talk. So I wanna thank our sponsors again, um, LA Cat and the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge and all of our participants for joining us tonight. Um, I know we had up to 65 people tonight. So that's really exciting to have you with us. Um, if you missed it, Sarah's going to throw up um, YouTube links so you can see um, the rest of our um, talks in this series. I'm grateful to our staff, Sarah Amaker, Grant Benoit, um, especially who have worked to organize this series along with our grad assistants, um, Autumn Johnson and Kirsten Campbell. Um, and aside from that, I would also like to point out on that YouTube, that same YouTube channel, um, our educator and grad assistants have been working with LSU um, creative writing students and photography students and there's a zine that will come out at our next first free Sunday in February and on our YouTube channel you can already find um, students reading their poetry in response to a lot of the images in Southbound um, so that's a really cool way to see the work if you can't come in person um, due to the pandemic the show is open until February 14th um, if you feel you can come safely we have distancing in place in the galleries and masks um, but I know that is different for everyone right now. So with that, I think it will be a good night. And just one last thank you to Susan and McNair. Thank, thank you, you guys. so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Susan and McNair. <laughs> Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you guys. All right, good night. <laughs>